Today we're going to take a look at Genesis chapter 16 with Hagar, the servant girl to Abram and Sarai, and the birth of Ishmael. Now, we need to put this in a little bit of context. Just previously in Genesis chapter 15, God confirmed his promise to Abram, confirming the promise that he would give him a son, and it would be a son from his own body. He confirmed that promise. Yet it was still going to be, and God didn't tell Abram this, but he found out by his own experience, it was still going to be many years until God fulfilled that promise. And as has been said, uh, the waiting can often be the most difficult part. And it certainly was oh, one of the hardest parts for Abram and Sarai. So let's pick it up here now. Genesis chapter 16, beginning at verses 1 and 2, where we read, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Now, again, many years before, God promised Abram that he would have many descendants. That's in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, Genesis chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. And then just in the previous chapter, as I said before, Genesis chapter 15, God confirmed this program, the promise. He said, no, listen, Abram, uh, one from your own body shall be your heir. But to this point, that promise had not been fulfilled. God had given Abram and Sarai no children. There were no children born to Abram through his wife, Sarai. And so what did Sarai do? Well, she had an Egyptian maidservant. Now, we normally assume, and I think this is probably a valid assumption, that this Egyptian maidservant named Hagar she was almost certainly part of what Abram received during his time in Egypt. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 16, it describes how Abram spent a period of time in Egypt, and he didn't acquit himself very well there. Fearing for his own safety, he lied about his relationship with his wife. Sarai, who was very beautiful, and the wife of an influential man, was taken into the harem of a ruler of Egypt. And he would have taken her as wife and, you know, uh, had relations with her, but God stopped this ruler of Egypt from doing that. Well, he sent Abram away, and when he sent Abram away, he sent him away with great riches, and it says that he sent him away with slaves. So part of what Abram received was almost certainly this slave girl, Hagar, who was a member of the household of Abram and his wife Sarai, and was probably one of Sarai's chief maids or assistants. Now, this is what Sarai said, verse 2. She said, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Sarai did understand something that is valid, that God is sovereign over the womb. God had promised descendants to Abram and Sarai, and they had not yet come for many years. There's a lot of pain there for Abram and Sarai, a lot of disappointment. We can imagine them as a young couple getting married and excited about the children, the many children that they think they're going to have. And as years go by, they don't have any children. And then God comes and makes this dramatic promise to Abram. Look, I'm going to make a nation from you. You will certainly have descendants. And God reinforces that promise, uh, not only giving it once, but at least reinforcing it twice in dramatic and specific ways. And yet they still had to wait. There's a lot of pain, pain of hope deferred, making the heart sick. As Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12 says, this was the pain of prayers that were not yet answered. This was the pain of arms that had never yet held their own child. This was the pain of public shame, for there was a fair amount of that in those ancient Near Eastern cultures for being childless. And then there's also the pain of blaming God. God. 
for one's problems. Friends, uh, this sort of pain uh, was a sickness that Abram and Sarai had to bear. A lot of pain involved with that. So Sarai says, verse 2, to her husband Abram, Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. Sarai encouraged Abram to take part in what was, at least in that day, essentially a surrogate mother arrangement. According to custom, that child would be considered the child of Abram and Sarai, not the child of Abram and Hagar. You see, Sarai could justify this as a way to fulfill God's promise. She could say something like this, Abram, God promised you that you would be the father of many nations. But, but he didn't specifically mention me. He didn't say that Sarai will be the mother of many nations. In the previous chapter, God had promised Abram, saying, one from your own body. And maybe Sarah was saying, well, this, the Lord said one from your own body. He didn't say one from my own body. Maybe, Abram, maybe you're the father of many nations, but I'm not the mother of those nations biologically. I'm only the mother of those nations by adoption, because this child that would be born from Abram and the slave girl Hagar, uh, it, it, we say girl, she was probably older, especially by this time. It had been many years that Abram and Sarai had been in Egypt. Uh, I would anticipate somebody in her, at the very least, her young 20s, maybe even a bit older. But, but here, the child would not belong to Hagar by law. In this sort of arrangement, the child would belong to Sarai and Abram, be her adopted child. Now, even though this might have made sense to Sarai. It was against God's will for many reasons. First of all, it was a sin of unbelief in God and in his promise. Sarai did believe in God's sovereignty over the womb, but then she acted against it, believing that God would not perform what he had promised. Secondly, it was a sin against God's plan for marriage. What's God's plan for marriage? That one man and one woman would come together in a one flesh relationship. And if Abram has relations with Hagar, the servant, then even if it's done with uh, Sarai's permission and arrangement, then it's still going against God's plan for marriage. Thirdly, it was a sin against Abram and Sarai's marriage. Friends, this surrogacy wasn't done in a doctor's office with a, a clinical transmission of fertility, but it was done in a bedroom. So sadly, verse 2 says that Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. You know, Sarai wasn't the first woman to be tormented by the thought Maybe my husband would be better off with someone else. Now, it was bad for Sarai to hold on to that thought, but it was much worse for Abram to heed the voice of Sarai in this matter. Friends, a godly Christian wife has a lot of wisdom for her husband. Uh, I know my precious wife, Ingalil, is a, uh, is a fountain of wisdom for me. And many husbands hopefully learn the value of listening to the wisdom of their wife. Yet no wife is infallible. And Abram was responsible for his sin here of heeding the unwise, unbelief-based advice of his wife, Sarai. Abram should have said something like this, Sarai, bless your heart. But you're my wife, and we're in this together. As difficult as this is, let's believe God all over again for a miracle. I don't want to sin against God and our marriage with this Egyptian servant. Now, uh, Ginsburg, Lewis Ginsburg, he writes in a collection of books behind here on my shelf, uh, Legends of the Jews, Ginsburg quotes a Jewish tradition saying, that before they came to live in the promised land, Abram and Sarai regarded their childlessness as a punishment for not living in the land God promised them. 
But after being in the land for 10 years, they still had no children. Again, that's just a legend. But you could see how it could be true in their circumstance. Sarai probably felt that it was time to do something about this problem. She probably thought along the lines of that old proverb. This proverb is not in the Bible, but it's a proverb. God helps those who help themselves. I want to say it again. That is not in the Bible, but many people believe it. And Sarai was acting along that logic. So verses 3 and 4, we read. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. After Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress, that is Sarai, became despised in her eyes. Notice what's happening here. Sarai, and there's almost a ceremonial feel about this, because it could have been done ceremonially, took Hagar, her maid, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. Sarai was acting in unbelief. Abram was acting in unbelief. He did not actually marry Hagar, but he acted towards Hagar as a man should act only towards his wife. And this happened, it says there in verse 3, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land. It had been more than ten years since the promise was made regarding Abram's descendants back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. Most of us would think, I would suppose, that 10 years is a long time to wait for the promise of God. But after feeling they had waited long enough, they did this. Now, the whole practice of surrogate parentage was known in the ancient world. And perhaps on some other occasions, it was acceptable to God. God's law later allowed for at least an analogous practice in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6, where uh, the descendants of a deceased person are raised as his descendants, or they're regarded as his descendants, even though he's deceased. But friends, this was not the right path for Abram. He was the friend of God. He was a man of God. God had a different way for him. You see, Abram and Sarai were so discouraged by all of this, so discouraged by more than 10 years in the promised land, but they had no children, that they approached this problem of being childless. They approached this problem by leaving God out of the matter. It was as if they said, Hey, if we remove God from this situation, how do we solve this? And that's always a wrong thing to do. Friends, God is never removed from any circumstance of ours. And men of women of faith, well, they must walk in faith, not in unbelief. And men and women of faith must live being mindful of the realm of the Spirit, not only being mindful of of the material world. Yes, I, I know there were many discouragements for Abram and Sarai in the material world. They would have marital relations and, and no pregnancy would come forth. And it had been that way for years, for decades in their married relationship. But they were called to not only look to the material, but to the spiritual. But the long wait for the promise discouraged them, and it made them vulnerable to acting in the flesh. Friends, even after this, it would still be something like 13 years until the child of promise came. When a believer impatiently tries to fulfill God's promises in their own effort, it accomplishes nothing, and it may even prolong the time until the promise is fulfilled. 
For example, later on in the book of Genesis, Jacob had to live in his exile for 25 years because he thought that he had to arrange the fulfillment of God's promise to get his father's blessing. As I said later on, that's in Genesis chapter 28 and chapter 33. Moses, later on in the book of Exodus, had to tend sheep for 40 years in the desert after he tried to arrange the fulfillment of God's promise by murdering an Egyptian. That's in Exodus chapter 2 and 3. Rather, it's much better to receive God's help than to try to help God with our own wisdom and even our unbelief. I appreciate what Donald Gray Barnhouse said about this. He said this, quoting Donald Barnhouse. He said, Those who are truly zealous for God frequently reach for fruit without first dying. Unfortunately, much Christian work is done in this way. And while there is conception, that child that is born can never be the heir. Christian work that is done merely through the zeal of human effort without counting the body as dead and Sarai as good as dead may produce great revival campaigns with but a few genuinely saved large church memberships with many tares among the wheat. But again, Abram and Sarai through probably a, a toxic combination of unbelief and discouragement. They went forward with this arrangement. That's why verse 4 says, So he, Abram, went into Hagar, and she conceived. They were acting according to their own power, their own wisdom, when it was agreed that Abram would inseminate Hagar not trusting in God's ability to provide an heir through Sarai. But this wasn't a matter of sensual romance. Even though they had sexual intercourse, you, you wouldn't say that this was an affair. According to some of the customs of the day, and again, I, I want to be very firm here. We can't say positively that this is what happened, but some of the customs of that day said that Hagar would sit on the lap of Sarai as Abram inseminated her to show that the child would legally belong to Sarai and that Hagar was merely a substitute for Sarai. We understand a bit of this from the similar occasion of using a servant as a surrogate mother in the case of Rachel giving Bilhah to Jacob when Rachel was barren. In that context, Genesis chapter 30 verse 3 reads, So she said, Here is my maid Bilhah, go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees, that I also may have children by her. That phrase used in Genesis chapter 30, verse 3, bear a child on my knees, refers to this ancient practice of surrogate adoption. And some believe that this phrase refers only to a symbolic placement of the child on the knees of the one who adopts it. But others believe that it refers to the surrogate sitting on the lap of the adoptive mother during both insemination and birth. For example, referring to Genesis chapter 30, verse 3, the 20th century Bible commentary says, these words are probably intended literally and not merely as figurative adoption. Now, uh, we should not regard this as a certainty, not at all that Hagar was inseminated and gave birth on the knees of Sarai. We don't know enough about this ancient practice. And even if it were an ancient custom, it doesn't mean that it was followed in every case. But this was really more of an expression of their unbelief and discouragement than it was what we might think of as being some kind of affair uh, in a modern context. But at the end of it, Verse 4 tells us that Hagar conceived. From Sarai's perspective, this was both a blessing and a curse. It was a curse 
because Abram succeeded in making Hagar pregnant, and this strongly suggested that the failure to provide an heir, a child, a son to Abram was because of a problem in Sarai, not her husband. And in a culture that so va highly valued childbearing, mothering the child of a wealthy and influential man like Abram gave a servant like Hagar great status. It made her appear to be more blessed than Sarai. You know, this is a good place to remind ourselves that results are not enough to justify what we do before God. It's not right to say, hey, they got a baby out of it. It must have been God's will. No, the flesh profits nothing. That's what John chapter 6, verse 63 says. The flesh profits nothing, but it can produce something. Doing things in the flesh may get results, but they may be results that are soon regretted. I like this saying. Think about it. Whatever a man or woman attempts to do without God will be a miserable failure or an even more miserable success. And that's what happened with this attempt to inseminate Hagar. It was a miserable success. That's why it says in verse 4 that when she saw that she had conceived, again, this is Hagar, her mistress, that is Sarai, became despised in her eyes. Hagar immediately began to think of herself as better and greater than Sarai. A bad situation just became worse. So look at the reaction of this in verses 5 and 6. Here we read, Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand due to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Sarai blamed the whole situation on Abram, and there was some reason to do this. Abram should have acted as the spiritual leader of that home, and he should have told his wife that God was able to perform what he promised, and that they didn't need to try to fulfill God's promise by disobeying him and by relying on man's strength and wisdom. But Sarai could sense what Hagar was sending forth to her. Hagar's contempt for Sarai was a real problem. She couldn't resist displaying an inappropriate haughtiness, thinking that her pregnancy somehow showed her to be better than Sarai. Now, Abram seemed to make a bad situation worse by turning the situation over to Sarai and not taking care of the child that he was the father to. He said, verse 6 to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. But notice, uh, that part of it was bad, but it was good that he put his relationship with Sarai first. Friends, isn't this a terrible and complicated situation? It would be best for Abram's marriage for him to allow cruelty towards Hagar. And that's not good. It's the mother of his child. It's, it's a terribly complicated and difficult situation. Friends, understand that these terribly complicated and difficult family situations often come from disobedience. All things considered, it's much easier to live life trusting and obedient to the Lord. It's far less complicated. God wants us to spare us from these awkward and difficult complications, things just like this in family life. So, verse 6 says that when Sarai dealt harshly with Hagar, she fled from her presence. Sarai's cruelty collided with Hagar's pride, and all Hagar could think to do was to run. Even with nowhere to go, 
she fled from the presence of Sarai, probably headed back to Egypt, her original home. Now, verse 7, as Hagar is fleeing out in the wilderness, it says, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Hagar's escape led her to a spring. Perhaps she was afraid to go any further, not being certain of the water supply. And so she stayed there. And in that difficult place, it says that the angel of the Lord found her. That's where God met her. And apparently, this appearance of the angel of the Lord was a physical presence and someone who spoke to Hagar as one person speaks to another. The passage here doesn't have the sense that this was merely a spiritual impression or that it was a voice in the wind. No, there was a person physically present with Hagar, and that person was the angel of the Lord. Later in the text, it's going to show us that Hagar understood that this physically present person was God himself. And friends, when God himself is physically present, we understand that it is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. How do we understand this? Well, we understand this because, first of all, of God the Father, it is said in the Bible that no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So of God the Father, it says in John chapter 1, verse 18, that no one has seen Him at any time. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, it says that no one has ever seen God in the person of the Father. Therefore, if God physically appeared and spoke as one person to another in the Old Testament, then we understand that this was an appearance of the eternal Son, the second person of the Trinity, before his incarnation in Bethlehem. Friends, Jesus Christ existed before he ever was born in Bethlehem. He existed eternally, in eternity past, as God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. And it seems that at times, he took on human appearance and appeared and interacted with people. And many of these appearances are described under the title in the Old Testament as an appearance of the angel of the Lord. Now, don't get misled by that phrase, angel of the Lord. Angel, in the ancient biblical languages, simply means messenger. And certainly we would agree that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, uh, the eternal Son, that he's more than a messenger, but he is a messenger. So this unique messenger of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, would later appear to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. The angel of the Lord would later appear to Moses in Exodus 3. The angel of the Lord would later appear to Balaam in Numbers 22. The angel of the Lord would later appear to Israel collectively in Judges 2. To Gideon in Judges 6. To Samson's parents in Judges 13. To David in 2 Samuel 24. And to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. But... This is the first appearance of the angel of the Lord, of what I believe, and I'm not alone in this belief, there's many who believe this, that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. This is the first appearance of the angel of the Lord in the Bible. Friends, think about that. He didn't first appear to Noah, Enoch, or Abram. By this title, the angel of the Lord first appeared to a single mother-to-be who had a pride problem and who was mistreated 
by the woman who put her into the whole mess. Friends, all of this should make us amazed at God's love for the unlikely. And we should never forget that God often delights in showing his great love to unlikely people. Now, look at what the angel of the Lord said to Hagar. Verse 8, where have you come from and where are you going? Aren't those great questions? Aren't those great questions, not just for Hagar in the wilderness, but for every human being? Where have you come from? And where are you going? Now, Hagar acted without thinking that. She acted without really considering where she came from, and she acted without really considering where was she going. But friends, if we would remember those two questions and the answers to those questions... That would save us as God's people from a lot of trouble. Now, Hagar thought she knew. Her response to those questions might be something like this. Well, I came from the most terrible place ever, and I'm going nowhere. But the angel of the Lord told her, no, no, no. I've got a plan for you. Let's move forward on this plan. The angel of the Lord told her in verse 9, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. <sighs> that might have been the last thing in the world that Hagar wanted to hear. But the angel of the Lord told her to repent. You've got to change your direction. And in that command to change her direction, there was an inherent promise. Here was the inherent promise. Obey me and I will protect you. Friends, the pre-incarnate Jesus didn't exactly tell Hagar to go back to an abusive household. He made an implied promise of protection. Now, starting at verse 10, here's the promise of the angel of the Lord to Hagar. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. The angel of the Lord promised Hagar, again verse 10, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. God not only implied a promise of protection, he also gave a clear promise to Hagar of staggering blessing. Your unborn son would be the father of of uncountable descendants. Now, friends, as the promise was fulfilled, Ishmael, her son, became the ancestor of the Arab peoples, just as her later half-brother Isaac would become the ancestor of the Jewish people. Abraham had two sons, one through Hagar, who became the father of the Arabic peoples, and the other named Isaac, who would become the father of the Jewish people. Isn't this strange? Doesn't myths make the long-standing conflict between the Arabs and the Jews even more tragic? They are brothers, and they share a common father in Abraham. But verse 11 says that the angel of the Lord told Hagar, you shall call his name Ishmael. Now, Ishmael was given a great promise, not only in the number of his descendants, but also in that he was the first one in the Bible given his name before he was born. You know what this tells us? God had a plan for this boy and for his descendants. God wouldn't have given him a name if he didn't have a plan for him. I want you to think for a moment about the descendants of Ishmael, the Arabic people. Many Christians today think they know God's plan 
for the descendants of Ishmael, the Arabic people. They think that God's plan for them is to destroy them. Well, after all, they hate the Jews. They persecute Christians. God should judge them. God should destroy them. Friends, I want you to understand that reaction is not rooted in the Bible. It's not rooted in this passage of Genesis chapter 16. I want you to consider this. That God could have allowed Hagar and her unborn child to die in the wilderness. Yet God didn't allow it. God specifically intervened so that it wouldn't happen, so that that baby would be born, so that Ishmael would be the father of the Arabic people. God could have allowed Hagar to live, but to disappear from the life and household of Abraham and Sarah. But God didn't allow that. Someone may argue that Ishmael's conception was because of sin and unbelief, but God could have erased him from the story, and God chose not to. This part of the story is God's doing. It was not man's doing. And God specifically commanded Hagar to go back to Abram and Sarai. God specifically commanded Hagar to stay in the story. Let me tell you, that says something very powerful. God's story for the Arabic people is not finished. Now, you may or may not know that there are many Christians among the Arabic people. Oh, they're a minority, of course. But there are many Christians, believers among the Arabic people. And we pray for Arabic believers. We pray that God would bless them. God would increase them. God would multiply them. God would give them success in evangelism. God would give them good Bible resources to help them. We want God's blessing upon the descendants of Ishmael. And we should also remember that angelic visitations and visits of Jesus continue to this day among the descendants of Ishmael. The angel of the Lord was not finished visiting Ishmael and his descendants. That's why we read in verse 11, You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. You know, that name Ishmael means God will hear. I think we should take that as a prompting to pray for revival, to pray for spiritual awakening among the Arabic peoples. Because when they cry out to Jesus, God will hear. It's in the name of their ancestor. But, verse 12 says, He'll be a wild man, and his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. The life of Hagar's son would not be easy, but God would still look over him and sustain him. Remember, I would say that if you want to look for an ill effect of this prophecy, that Ishmael would be a wild man and his hand would be against every man and every man's hand against him, that that has mostly been seen in violence and murder among Arabic peoples themselves. Friends, they kill each other even more than they kill Jews and Christians for their own sake. You could say even more than for the sake of Christians, we pray, God brings salvation to the Arabic people. Now, starting at verse 13. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahai Roi. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. 
Verse 13 tells us that Hagar knew that this was no mere angel who appeared to her. The angel of the Lord was also the God who sees, the same one who watched over Hagar and the yet-to-be-born Ishmael. After meeting with El Royah, that is, you are the God who sees, Hagar knew that if God could be with her in the wilderness, then he could also be with her in having to submit to Sarai. It was as if Hagar said to God, You've looked upon me, and now I can look upon you. That face-to-face -face relationship with God brings transformation. So, verse 14 says that Hagar bore Abram a son. Apparently, Hagar did return with a submitted heart. She told the whole story to Abram and Sarai, and Abram named the child Ishmael, just as instructed in the meeting with the angel of the Lord that Hagar described to them. Hagar might have said when she returned, I fled from you because I was so miserable and I thought that I couldn't continue here. But the Lord met me and he told me that he would see me through. He told me to come back and submit to you. So that's why I'm here. You see, Hagar thought, and, and again, I don't think she was crazy in thinking this, but Hagar thought that her circumstances needed transformation, when in fact, she needed transformation. Again, Donald Gray Barnhouse said this, If we seek to change our circumstances, we will jump from the frying pan into the fire. We must be triumphant exactly where we are. It is not a change of climate that we need, but a change of heart. The flesh wants to run away, but God wants to demonstrate his power exactly where we have known our greatest chagrin. Again, that's a quote from Donald Gray Barnhouse in his commentary on the book of Genesis. Now, Christians today have an even clearer and more wonderful promise of this than Hagar ever had. We have the promise of Jesus Christ, where he said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So friend, if you must submit in difficult circumstances, God sees it. If you ache under the pain of life or under ministry, God sees it. If you feel like running, God sees it. God has met you. He has sent Jesus near to you. And he gives you new hope. Walk in the power of that in Jesus' name. Now, before we conclude, let's take a quick look at just a few ways that Genesis chapter 16 points to Jesus Christ. First of all, we saw, and we spent a lot of time talking about this, so we don't need to spend any more. Jesus here in verse 7 is clearly the angel or the messenger of the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Secondly, Jesus really is, as it's described in verse 13, the God who sees. El Royah, the God who sees. Friends, Jesus is with you to the end of the age. He sees. He sees your struggles. He sees your heart. He sees your compromise. He sees your sin. But he sees. And he sees his people. He's not distant or detached from them. Jesus is the God who sees. And then finally, Jesus in this chapter is not only the angel or the messenger of the Lord. He's not only El Royai, the God who sees, but he's also, number three, the Savior of the world, including the Arabic peoples and every nationality, every group that you can think of. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, as John chapter 4, verse 42 says, including the Arabic nations.
We can be grateful for that and pray with great confidence that God will do a work among the Arabic peoples, among the people in the Middle East in general, and among all the nations of the world, because Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. We thank you for that, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the great mercy and kindness that you showed, appearing as the angel of the Lord to a fearful, discouraged servant girl who needed to repent and make a new start. Thank you that you do similar work in our life, Lord. We want to stay sensitive and compliant to you, Lord God. For you are the God who cares. You are the God who sees. You are the Savior of the world. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.